Hi, welcome everybody to the CEU Executive MBA Budapest Open Day, live from CEU campus, the first event we're hosting on site here. It's a historic uh, moment, basically. My name is Thomas Lamel. I'm the Senior Program Manager of CEU Executive MBA, and I will guide you through the evening. You will have the chance to meet current participant Natalia and Alam Gabor later on, and Andrew Heffler will then deliver a very current keynote presentation on making better habits on improving strategic communication. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat box or to just raise your hands here in class, and I will collect them for the Q&A session at the end of the event. Let's start with the program presentation. Is an MBA still worth it? You don't have to go very far these days to encounter that we are witnessing fundamental transformations in the world in a century. In 2008, we had a big financial crisis, in 2015, we've had a large refugee crisis, and right now, we're facing the biggest pandemic in a century. These changes are part of a, brush, of a much broader set of transformation that is taking place at the moment. Some of these changes are positive, and some of these changes are pretty dangerous, to be honest. So the key question is, how do we as business professionals prepare for this challenging and unpredictable environment? The obvious question is, is an MBA the way to do it? We have seen, ex we have seen an explosion of online education, and I'll show you why we believe an MBA is still worth it. If you're interested in further education, you usually start searching for an MBA in the city you live in. What you tend to find is mostly a pretty standard vanilla MBA curriculum. Um, the faculty who are delivering the program are pretty much local. The number of international students is relatively low. Some programs in Western Europe can be quite expensive. And a local program allows you not to leave your job. If you contrast that with the top business schools in the world, mostly in the US, they often have a very differentiated curriculum. They offer a certain expertise or a certain perspective or a certain mission. And because of their full-time format, their student body is pretty much international. You're leaving the labor market for one or even two years, which is another financial burden. And these programs are rather expensive at more than 120,000 euros. You may have to move your family to the MBA location as well. So what we do at CU is to offer you the best of two worlds. There is no work interruption, thanks to the practical and flexible modular format. I will talk about the modular format later. The executive MBA at CEU is mission driven. I will talk about the executive MBA for the open world philosophy later. We have an international student body because of the modularity of the program. Actually, according to the Times Higher Education, we are the second most international university in the world. Participants can fly in and out, which is a major advantage of the program. So I just want to introduce some members of our faculty to you. Um, the follow-up course on big data and artificial intelligence will be taught by Miklos Koren, one of the leading scholars in the field uh, in Europe with the Harvard PhD. For strategy, you'll have Yusuf, who is taught in more than 40 countries and advises leading Fortune 500 companies. For marketing, you'll have Aishu, a new entry in High Potential coming from Florida. For economics, Mark Kaufmann, an expert in applied theory and a PhD from Harvard. For leadership, Austin, our world-class psychologist um, and with executive education experience on four continents, he will lead the way. If you're new to finance, Joy is a uniquely gifted educator Generation after generation of our students tell us how she's just unique in explaining very complex financial concepts. And if you're already experienced in finance, uh, you'll be placed in the advanced track course with Adam Savadovsky, a leading expert on complex investments with a PhD from Princeton. And for innovation, you'll have Mike Labelle, who holds a prestigious EU Jean Monnet chair. Here are some examples for, of our uh, 
uh, visiting faculty, Christian Zelos from Stanford University, Miklos Savary from Columbia, Omar Hernandez from Berkeley, Hui Chen from the University of Zurich, and Milena Nikolova, um, Chief Behavior Officer at Behavior Smart. So here's what the program looks like. It's a nine module program. The dates you can see on the screen are not going to change. So you can basically plan ahead, plan your studying around professional and family activities based on these dates. As you can see, we have two modules in the first year, four in the second year, and three modules in the third year, which gives you flexibility and a balance in your life. As you might have seen, we are piggybacking around popular European holidays, like 1st of May, 1st of November, and August 15, when it's easier for you to take time off your job. In the summers, our bespoke and cutting edge leading leadership program takes place in Budapest, in Budapest, and you'll have the opportunity to benefit from electives from the faculty in the world we invite to teach your classes. There will come a day when you finish your degree, finish with us and join CEU alumni from around the world. As I already said, CEU is the second most international university in the world, and you can rely on an active elite network on every continent. We have city level chapters, um, basically country level chapters, basically wherever you are in the world, you'll find CEU alumni to interact with, to mingle, to network with. This network is truly a network you can count on and one of the key assets that we have in the program. So the question is, how are we able to offer such a high quality program at only 25,000 euros of tuition? The answer obviously lies in our founder and benefactor, George Soros, who created CEU with the mission to promote open society. Just recently, George Soros uh, made a further contribution to CEU's mission by offering another billion dollars in endowment to create the Open Society University Network, which means we are the best endowed university in Europe. So what does the MBA for the open world mean? First of all, when we talk about open world, we mean skepticism towards hierarchies, towards dogmas and privileges, both in context of how we teach, but also in composition of the cohort. Diversity is key to creating a successful program that we have. Secondly, we believe in debate and radical, rational thinking. Every idea can be challenged. We believe in facts and arguments rather than narratives and fake news. Narratives create polarization in societies. And we believe the best way to challenge this narrative-based discourse is to make arguments based on facts and realities, which is the hallmark of Karl Popper's definition of open societies. We are fundamentally opposed to all kinds of discrimination and we actively promote diversity within our program. The way we finance the scholarship means we create opportunities for people who traditionally have not been able to actually join such a high quality program. And one of the key aspects of this philosophy is that we see managers and professionals, not just as people who deal with resources and businesses, but we also believe that managers go beyond that. They are positive change agents. So what does the typical CEU executive MBA classroom look like? Currently, we have 65 managers with an average of 14 years of work experience, including a minimum of, th of three years of leadership experience. As you can see from the uh, image, from the, from the background image, we use state-of-the-art classroom technology and setups in order to facilitate discussion and interaction. We make use of case-based learning rather than, rather than traditional lectures that you will find in local MBA programs. And we want to take you, experts in your specific field, from this level of functional expertise to the strategic level. So with regard to the current corona situation, a typical, typical question is, are you moving online? Are we going to uh, have the modules on site? How are you dealing with the, on, with the corona situation? 
we are we have come up with a with an approach to ensure the best learning experience in class by offering a hybrid format, which allows you to choose freely at every module if you want to participate online or on site. Because the situation with regard to Corona could change in your country, could change in your industry, could change in your family, and you have full flexibility to decide if you want to participate online or on site at every module. We have studio grade microphone, microphones capturing uh, lecturer and all participants. We have invested a lot of money into offering the best technical infrastructure for you. We're not just placing you in front of laptops and, and that's it. We uh, invested in infrastructure with audio and video in order to get you the best learning experience. Um, part of that uh, infrastructure that we invested in are large screens and high quality cameras. In our on our campus in Vienna and Budapest. We have created physical and virtual breakout rooms for the support teams. The support teams are teams that you will get to know within the modules. You will be interacting with those teams later on once you're in the program. And we use personalized virtual backgrounds. So it's easy for you to identify your fellows and the professors, the lecturers, and all people involved and you know who said what, and you can relate, directly relate to any statement and comment on those statements by calling those people by their names. And of course, we offer high quality individual support. If you have any issues, technical issues, logistical issues, we are there to help you and to facilitate the best learning experience in these challenging times. We, we are aware of Zoom fatigue. We're aware that we're spending our meetings online most of the time now, and that it takes a lot of patience and uh, uh, to, to go online for, uh, for a Zoom call or for, for an online module, but you'll have every support you can think of. So tuition is 25,000 euros for the whole program and includes all the credits, 25,000 25, euros for the whole package, for the whole program. And in order to defray your other costs, um, we have a special rates at partner hotels and negotiated discounts for flights with Lufthansa Group and Austrian Airlines, which bring you, brings you to Vienna and or Budapest. So we invite you to join the open world. The application deadline is June 6th, and the application starts online on our website. However, I strongly encourage you to apply as soon as possible because we have a first come, first serve policy. And the sooner you apply, the higher your chances in the application process are. You're invited to book an individual one-on-one -on -one consultation with me to discuss your questions and optimize your application. I will shoot the link for the one-on-one -on -one consultation later on in, in, the, in the chat box. So I think it's one thing to hear about the program from the program office. I mean, that we're praising the program is just an obvious thing for us because we're convinced of the program and happy to present it to you. But I think it's another thing to actually listen and to get, get information from people who have done the program or are currently in the program. So I'm happy to introduce Natalia Oskoyakov to you, who's currently on Zoom, and Gabor Zabo, who's in class right now. Natalia is the director of Valley of Arts Festival and the Budapest-based Startup Safari. And I would like to start with Natalia by just asking can you please tell us about your background, uh, briefly about your background and why you chose CEO Executive MBA? So welcome everyone again. And uh, well, uh, I have a kind of a mixed background on one hand, but on the other hand, it uh, always included some cultural strong uh, uh, relation in it. So I finished my studies at the Corvinus University Budapest on one hand, but attended uh, Nottingham Trent University courses and went for a semester to the New Zealand Dunedin University and uh, did a Master of European Studies at KU Leuven University as well. Uh, but still uh, always had a relationship with culture, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs a bit, and uh, worked for the Council of Art. Uh, which is a, a cultural institution in uh, Hungary, works for the Open Society Foundations, and uh, now, well, 
I've been the director of the Valley of Arts uh, Festival for uh, eight years now and uh, actually initiated other two smaller uh, festivals like the Karagdam Festival and Irving Eshegy Picnic and partnered at the Startup Safari Budapest uh, kind of a lobbying activist myself on the cultural field because I'm uh, leading the festival section of the Music Hungary uh, Association and uh, while well, doing, uh, doing this whole bunch of work with having a, a really nice daughter as well. So I think I, I have to jug juggle around everything like an acrobat, the CU executive MBA, the, all the job factors and my family life as well. I'm, I'm a kind of person who is uh, now, as uh, you have heard, uh, been leading my own venture and uh, being an entrepreneur for eight years now and you know as I'm leader this, of this organization and we have uh, uh, some hundred of people uh, I'm leading at but you know after a while I realized that perhaps I'm just uh, uh, kind of uh, going around my own ideas and uh, I really wanted to uh, find a uh, kind of an MBA where I can meet uh, a lot of uh, people with mixed backgrounds that uh, would inspire me how to reinvent, uh, especially uh, in the COVID time, my entrepreneurship and how to uh, try to do something new. So we actually shifted Startup Safari Budapest to the online version as well. But uh, all the people I met here, especially uh, so my all the classmates had uh, really inspiring thoughts that I actually then could use uh, in my everyday life afterwards as well. And of course, then when I looked at the curriculum, I found it uh, very uh, kind of uh, demanding on a way, <laughs> and it is, but I guess an MBA has to be demanding. But uh, I could see from the first uh, side that it would be really useful for me not to, you know, just to, just to try to think out of the box uh, and not to be stuck in my own ideas and my ways that I do my, uh, my uh, companies here. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it is an intellectual journey that you uh, uh, came, why, that's why you came here. I mean, uh, that's just obvious. Um, you talked about the diverse backgrounds. Can you just give us a brief overview of the different backgrounds in your class right now? Well, it comes from uh, some multinational companies, goes through some banks, but even actually people working for European cultural institutions or cultural uh, institutions and uh, some NGOs as well and uh, doing some lobbying with different fields and uh, numerous uh, other smaller uh, smaller entrepreneurs as well uh, so I think it's it's kind of really diverse in the business background point of view I mean that's true uh, of course we have the overview of the participants in the program and I can I can totally confirm that we have environmental activists human rights activists people uh, coming from entrepreneurship engineers medical doctors in the program corporate people um, it's, it's, it's a really diverse program, not just with regard to professional backgrounds or nationalities. It's also di a very diverse backgrounds when it comes to uh, educational backgrounds, social backgrounds, and it's perfectly dis resembled in the current program. My greatest fear was in a way that I'm co coming from the cultural sector and in this from this NGO slash cultural sector that I would meet, you know, only corporate people. Uh, and perhaps I'm, I'm already kind of too far away from that world. But it was for me quite a surprise to have such a diverse background uh, among my classmates. Stop frightening off the corporate people. <laughs> but we have uh, when Alana Gaba is coming from the corporate world. I mean, that's just the perfect display, you know, of the diversity of, you know, we have people coming from the cultural field, with people coming from human rights, and we have people coming from the corporate field. That's I think the perfect mix to learn from. Because if you're if you would be in a group with, with people from your from the same country, with the same background, from uh, from the same company, basically, or the same industry. 
There's nothing to learn from those people. But diversity happens when you're exposed to different styles, to different approaches, to different ways of thinking, to different ways of uh, solution making, of uh, decision making. This is where learning kicks in, and um, this can only be achieved in a very diverse group. And we offer those uh, diverse groups, as you can tell. Uh, Natalia, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to move on to Gabor, who is yes. on site right now. Yes. Just... Okay. Thank you, Thomas. It's very strange to be in a room and <laughs> talk to people and not to a Zoom <laughs> stuff. Uh, yeah. Gabor, please tell us um, why you choose why you chose a CU yes. uh, MBA back then when you sorry. Okay, so. Uh, very shortly about my background. So I graduated at the Technical University of Budapest back in the past century as an electrical engineer specialized in telecommunication. Uh, also, I spent a year uh, uh, studying mobile communication in France. Then I was working for two smaller uh, Hungarian companies. Then I spent nine, yeah, nine years in the Netherlands for an uh, international organization. Uh, that was all about uh, telecommunication. So I was uh, busy with uh, designing a uh, voice-based system, uh, working on the operations of the systems, or even at the international organization, uh, uh, producing standards, interoperability standards. Uh, after, in, back in 2011, I came back to Hungary. I joined uh, uh, the Hungarian office of a um, big multinational investment bank still in the firm of uh, in the field of uh, telecommunication to lead a team of uh, of a couple of engineers uh, working uh, with the data and voice networks and throughout the years throughout my career my role shifted from the technical um, in my inside i'm still an engineer <laughs> <laughs> but i started to move towards various leadership roles uh, project leadership, technical leadership, people uh, management. And I realized that uh, that's, that's, that's a totally different uh, topics, different challenges. Uh, I attended various uh, classes provided, uh, offered by my uh, workplaces. And I realized that it would be great to have a, a structured overview of, uh, of those I would say soft skills. Let's let's put it in this way. Sorry, from an engineer, the finance is a soft skill. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that, but it's not an offense. But uh, uh, so, why I see you? Uh, I've met a couple of people uh, at my workplace uh, who completed the same uh, executive MBA. Uh, by the way, uh, I was the in the class in the last class of the previous format, which was uh, uh, fully in Budapest. And uh, even there was a very great presentation uh, at my workplace. And I'm used to do decisions quickly. So basically, I made a decision in one day that, yes, I attended that presentation. I talked to a couple of people who already made it. And in a day, I, I decided. And it was actually funny in a way because we, I remember uh, we had that presentation on Thursday. And I heard that, OK, to apply, I need a, a recent uh, TOEFL exam. People thought, oh, don't worry. On Monday, we will have a TOEFL exam on site. <laughs> and that was the oldest order building of, uh, of CU. <laughs> and I decided during the weekend, yes, I will go. And so basically, that was the story how I uh, I chose and and actually actually I I would say it was a great choice. Can you? I mean, you're welcome to to ask questions, of course, to Natalia and and, and Gabor, If you have any questions, feel free to just uh, shoot in. Uh, can you tell us something about the alumni network? How approachable it is? How international it is? Uh, it uh, alumni network. You know, if you uh, realize that someone uh, completed uh, CU, any kind of CU, and uh, mm. more or less uh, executive MBA, that's a totally different level of, of uh, connection. It's a, approaching a people that completed CU, uh, executive MBA, is like almost like being an old friend or, or uh, old working relationship. Uh, I would say in the past year, due to the circumstances, I was not, unfortunately, not really involved 
in the in, in the alumni, but but I should say that if I know that someone completed the CEU Executive MBA, or if someone knows about me that I completed that, the start of the conversation will be very different than with, uh, with strangers. Just to give you an impression of the alumni network, when I started uh, uh, at CEU, I was just we, we before Corona, of course, we um, to play we took part in uh, MBA fairs all over Europe, uh, presenting the um, Executive MBA at Career Fest. And I just reached out to people on LinkedIn and Facebook who, according to our database, were alumni. I didn't know these people in person. I, they were just names and email addresses. And I just reached out to those people, asking them, you know, hey, we're coming to Zurich on Monday. Would you would you like to have a dinner or would you like to meet for to have to, for drinks? And in every city, it was easy to approach these people and to uh, uh, even though we didn't know each uh, each other before. It was so easy to reach out to those people and have a drink and go have, have dinner. And in every city, they helped us to, to mingle and to make new friends, basically. And this spirit still exists on the broader level. We have a huge alumni network. We have an alumni relations department at CEU, which uh, offers alumni relations in a more structured way, of course. We offer uh, alumni course offerings in the summer. Um, we gather alumni at the leadership module in the summer, so you can network not just with your class, but also with the uh, previous class that is already in the program and with alumni from the past. So they are pretty much engaged. And as you can see, our one of our alumni is uh, here tonight. And it was just um, it, it was just one email to ask him, you know, can you please come and, and talk to our uh, potential um, applicants? And it, it, it was an easy thing. That's how approachable and that this alumni network is. It's a very US. Uh, uh, driven or, you know, uh, approach of, of uh, uh, connectivity. Thank you, Gabor. I would like you. to move on to the next part. Let me just share the screen again. Let's come to the main part of the of the night or keynote presentation by Andrew Hefler. Andrew is an actor, director and trainer working in theater, music, film and television um, for quite some time now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not <laughs> emphasizing on that. No, lower expectations, please. <laughs> <thoughts. laughs> he trained, he trained actors, directors, writers, um, and a variety of professionals, and improving communication skills for over 15 years. He's instructor and coach at the CEU uh, leadership program. He's the founder and artistic director of uh, Grund Theater, yeah. a member of. Uh, Madhouse Theatre and lead host at Brain Bar, yeah. Europe's biggest futurology festival. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks so much. Uh, so wonderful to see everyone here, and I thank you guys for joining us today. I just to tell you a little little story. Yesterday, I'm in the car and I'm driving with my wife down to Chinatown, which in Budapest is down on Yegen, so some of you may know it, may not. And by my estimation, it's the best food in the country currently. So we go down there for knickknacks and snacks. And because it's her birthday, I'm going to take her down to the street. And we're going to get some grill and we're going to get a little food. We may take some back to the kids. So I'm in the car driving. And as we're going, it's Sunday traffic, and maybe people are cutting in lanes, and maybe it's a bit busy and odd and just slow, and choices that are made seem unnecessarily dangerous. And me being a driver that I am, from California, driving since I'm 15, I'm like, geez, come on. Why, you know, why are you going so fast? Why are you going so slow? And I'm thinking, of course, and maybe you think this too sometimes, I know how to drive. If, if something, I know how to drive. I'm, a, I'm an above average driver. I'm cautious. I have great physical acumen with the car. I pay attention. I'm analytical when I need to be. I'm never aggressive. I am assuming defensive driving is my future. I get it. Do you feel the same? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that's an interesting thing, right? It's an interesting thing because in California, they take this poll every once in a while, and they do it, of course, in other places. 93%, very consistently, over 90% of people polled believe that they are an above-average driver. Something stinks about these numbers, right? <laughs> Something doesn't make sense if you're a statistician. Now, another thing is, is that they polled professors in the UK some years ago, and they consistently did this. And of the polled professors, 
90 plus percent of them believed that they were an above average professor, that they were above average in lecturing, above average in research, and above average in actually explaining very difficult concepts to people. Well, again, I could be showing myself and my peers as very immodest in this case, but it does demonstrate that it might be very difficult to get us to change if we believe we're great. In fact, over 66% of professors think that they are in the top 25 percentile. <laughs> so again, something's wrong with the numbers. And then they pulled people from organizations and they pulled people from corporate centers and they pulled people from everywhere and they asked them, do you consider yourself to be a logical, critical thinker who essentially bases their decisions on ration, rationale, and they and that you are consistent in this way. And again, over 90% of people said that that was true, right? So all of this is really a bit alarming because this can't make sense, or it means that there's no such thing as average, right? There's no point. But actually what it points to is that we're all seriously overestimating ourselves. <laughs> we're seriously overestimate, uh, overestimating ourselves. And we actually, over time, develop this understanding or this idea that becomes very delusional, this uh, illusory sense of superiority at things. Now think of com communication. Now think of your skills in communication and think what you do with this because you're born to do this. You're a social animal. You absolutely are born into a world that requires this of you. And you assume that you know how to do this pretty well, right? Well, here's the thing. We, because now you really have a horse in this race. And I'm guessing that this horse is being jockeyed a little bit by ego, <laughs> right? And so you really think that this is your case. And, and as this is with communication, the idea is that, well, I kind of know how to do this right most of the time. It's the other people around me that don't do this very well. And therefore, we end up with a lot of issues with communication. And the thing is, is that this also leads to finger pointing. And now let's look at this in a corporate or business environment. And actually, the numbers are astounding. That the guess is, or the numbers are, they indicate that 20 to 30% of potential profits or collateral problems happening year after year because of miscommunication, mishandled communication, mishandled relationships, and all these sorts of things. So businesses are willing to leave that much on the table to not solve this problem. And then we have the other side of the coin, when you ask the employees. You ask the employees, what's going on in your workplace? And what do they say? Well, here's the number. 85 to 90% of people who work somewhere say that their superiors are subpar communicators. <laughs> they say that they don't do a great job of communicating consistently. They don't do a great job of including, empowering. They don't do a great job of clarifying. They don't do a great job of motivating or praising. And we oftentimes don't know what the point is, what's happening, and why. And this actually ends up being, and I'm sorry about the mask thing, but it's going there. It actually ends up being the thing that costs motivation, costs people to leave organizations, costs people projects, failures co go unspoken about, and immense amount of resources and money are lost just based on this problem alone. And so here we are. We've got this thing. What is the theory? What would we, what could we all agree on? Now I'll say this. Do we believe, do you believe that organizations should have a strong communicative and behavioral culture? And that culture should be kept in an authentic and open way. That authenticity and openness are prized qualities of this. Do we believe that? Do we believe that feedback and sharing should be done with consistency and done with a constructive intent? That it should even be done somewhat systematically so that we believe in this idea that excellence is born from mistakes, failures, and openness, and that we look at these things and then we build on these things because that's how we build to that excellence. And we need communication to facilitate that. Could we agree that? Could, could people yeah. here say that that makes some sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then how about the cultivation and maintenance of trust, the fostering of empowerment, and the inclusiveness of everyone in a group? and the acknowledgement of people in the business through thick and through thin. And we actually do this habitually. So that it actually becomes part of the fiber, the fabric and the fundament of the company. Could everybody here agree that this makes some sense? Would this sound about right? Yeah? If a family did this, would it sound like the family's in pretty good shape? 
Now, if a business does this, it sounds like it's in good shape. So here's the thing. Is this the case? Because we all agree. Is this what's happening? No. Why? What's stopping us? What is keeping us from achieving this? Because we know what the costs are. I think I, I have bad news. I believe what's stopping us is anxiety. I actually believe fundamentally fear is what's preventing this from really happening. You are afraid. I am afraid. And you and I are not likely in our lifetimes to ever get over this fear. That's the reality of it. This anxiety is with us. It's evolutionary. It's part of your makeup. It's part of what got us here. But what are these fears that are so prevalent and so hard to shake? There are three of them. The fear of the unknown future, the fear of judgment by your peers, and the fear of transformation or change, and especially doing that in front of your peers, right? You're a genius at looking consistent, right? Imagine yourself standing at a bus stop and you've just had a bit of a quick meal and something stuck between your teeth and it's driving you nuts. Have you ever had this feeling? And you're standing at the bus stop and it's driving you nuts and there's a few people there and you're, you're looking to see if they're watching you while you're trying to dislodge this from your mouth. And if you were to be caught and seen by them, it would be horrifying, right? So you're a genius. You'll leave it in there and suffer. <laughs> Wait till you get home and sort this out, right? So these things, these fears make you human. It means you're vulnerable. It means you have values. It means that things matter to you. But these are overdeveloped. They're steroid. And they're not necessary as much in the 21st century. This was about keeping you safe on savannas from large cats. And now you're actually this afraid from emails. And now you're terrified of getting called into a meeting underprepared. Now you're horrified to get called to a client meeting where you didn't have a great experience last month. You're afraid of these things just like a, a saber-toothed cat. <laughs> right? And so something is very irrational about all of this. And actually, this is exactly the reason that we, ex we experience these failures in communication, and it's why we actually don't make better habits out of them. So as Thomas pointed out, uh, I'm Andrew Hepler. I'm an actor. I'm a director. Uh, I'm a screenwriter, and I am a trainer or an instructor, and I train people through the guise or through the techniques of improvisation. And that means that I take this entire technical body of improvisation, whatever we define that is, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and I apply it to the principles of behavior and communication. And I do this with the idea to turn conscious growth into intuitive action. So improvisation might be something you could define as human cognition human cognition in the present, right? The skills for embracing the unknown future, the skills to manage the scrutiny or judgment of your peers, and the skills to embrace and become an active participant in your changes and transformations, right? And so these skills are about being responsive in the moment and interacting in the moment, bringing awareness and alternatives to the processes that are already happening right now. Assessing them, analyzing them, and then making that, cho that choice in the moment based on that and saying yes to what's happening and applying that decision. The culture and courage to change ultimately and how exactly to do that. So find universities in the world with esteemed MBA programs, Harvard, Stanford, Northwestern, USC, School of, uh, London School of Economics, et cetera for many, many years now, have dedicated countless amounts of resources and time to researching executive communication and innovation skills. And they've done this through experiential educative work, primarily based on using improvisational skill building as the methodology to do this to better train executives in the MBA program. And the schools that I just mentioned primarily use this technology to train executive education and communications. And that's what we bring to you guys here in part at CEO. This experiential 
education where it is you talking about practical things that you can utilize and put into your everyday life so that you can ultimately apply them to be part of your communication habits. I'll give you some experiences or just some examples over the years of what I've, what I've run into. I ran, well, I've run for many, many years different trainings. One example that I have is a presentation skills training that I ran some years back now. And uh, usually these trainings look like two days, six participants come, and we have all this time together to basically spend on the fundaments of how to present. How to present. What, is, what is your presentation style? How do we build that? And we had these six participants. One of them was a very, very kind, sweet, but very shy, painfully shy lady. And her five cohorts from work. And again, the levels of these present presenters were mixed. Some of the people were particularly good. Some of the people were kind of getting somewhere. And then there was this lady who was horribly shy, meek. And as we went through the exercise, we had a very first presentation. I could see that she was pained. But slowly but surely, we kind of just took things up step by step, just building little bits and pieces over time, addressing the facial expressions, addressing the concept of, of eye contact, addressing the concept of trading minds, sticking with the listener's uh, mindset, values, and needs. And all these little things just started seeping in slowly for her over the course of two days. But actually, that slowly turned into very quickly, because at the end of two days, she got up. And she, she made a presentation that not only excelled past the entire group, but it looked like we just got it off YouTube from somewhere. Now, granted, this was an exceptional, exceptional experience and a very, very strange thing to see that somebody would just so dramatically and drastically change. And it made us very, very emotional, frankly. All of her peers were just, they couldn't believe it. And I just asked her a little bit about it afterwards. And she said, I'll send you a mail. And she sent me a mail. And in the mail, she said, the weird thing is, is that I knew that this was always in me. I just never knew when it was going to come out. And the thing is, is that's what's up. It's not a talent. It's not some crazy thing you're born with. It's something that you can learn to do. You get the anxiety out of the way, and then your version of communication, your version of you starts to come out, right? It's about developing the deeper meta skills. It's about finding these skill sets sometimes that are untapped in you or that are a little bit dwarfed or quieted. So improvisational skill building addresses all three of our fears that we've mentioned, that unknown future, the judgment by peers, and this idea of transformation. And it actually turns them into strengths. It gets you, it gets you into taking risks. It gets you into being empathetic towards others, showing flexibility and willingness to adapt and putting that into practice, doing practical things to demonstrate that, being generous with your listening and with your time. Now, the thing is, is that that's exactly what people who work for organizations say that they miss most from leaders. So that's exactly what we do here at CEU, is we focus on that because we have our work cut out for us. We have to build these skills so that we meet these needs. We're biased and we have a delusional estimation of our own skills and powers. We're happy to criticize and underestimate those of others. And we are concerned about the unknown future and all of these other fears that we have. And there is one more issue. Theoretically, most of us agree wholeheartedly on what works. <laughs> wholeheartedly, the, the, the Theory of communication in the world is not greatly debated, at least the interpersonal theory of communication. Maybe there's a few good questions here and there, some intercultural differences and that sort of thing. But basically, good communication and thorough, caring, focused, clear communication kind of looks the same in Hawaii, Chile, Bangladesh, wherever. It kind of looks the same, and we certainly all can relate to it. But why is it we don't? somehow still come to some consensus. My, my 15 year old son is, is a, he's a lovely kid. He's very, very open. He's a very, very warm hearted. He's very sensitive. He's, <laughs> he's also very witty and he is also extremely mischievous and has a very serious nose for trouble, right? And so I have to deal with this because he's a handful and 
the thing is, is me as a communication trainer, I'm thinking, well, I always know I know how to manage this. Of course, I'm going to be able to speak to them. I'm going to be very assertive. I'm going to be a really good listener. I'm going to be balanced and even tempered, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to fall into the trappings and bad habits. But the thing is, is his honesty comes out with great candor. He, he always volunteers stories to me, right? He tells me exactly what's going on in his life. And I should be thrilled about this. I'm very lucky. And so he tells me openly that he smokes cigarettes with his friends. It happens. They're out. They're smoking cigarettes. That's a thing. And I just have to deal with that information, right? So this information doesn't surprise me, nor does it please me, <laughs> right? <laughs> And I, but I have to appreciate this candor. I have, to, I have to cultivate this. I don't want to lose this. This is a great communication habit, something between us that we want to certainly keep. And so eventually I'd like him to stop dabbling in cigarettes. But what do I do? He comes home some weeks back. I give him a hug and I smell his shirt and he smells like cigarettes. And I'm like, God, your shirt smells like Lucky Strikes. <laughs> he looks at me, makes a sour face, like he's the dad, yeah? Like, I've been the aggressor, the kid. <laughs> and then I think I, I screwed up. It's my mistake. Because I chose my ego, my emotions, and my frustration over actually communicating with him in a way that keeps the candor, keeps the openness, and keeps everything alive. Because my future of getting him to get away from cigarettes is not going to be found through my passive-aggressive or active-aggressive activity. <laughs> It's going to come from me being fair, open, even, and picking my humor or picking my criticisms in other points and places in other ways. And that's it. I have work to do. We all have work to do. And it's not enough to learn the skills the theoretically because a good communicator is something that you are. I mean, rather, it's not something that you are. It is something that you do. No? Just like empathy is not, and empathetic is not something that you are. Empathy is something that we do, right? And that's where it's felt. That's where it makes sense. And the challenges we're facing are widening, exponent are widening exponentially. It's not just the interpersonal communication now. We've got, our, we've got our volatile, unpredictable, complex and ambiguous world happening around us. We're in 2D worlds, we're on Zoom, we're in written communication now more than ever, and there's tons of room for errors and issues. And that means that there's tons of room for growth for us to pay attention to the pitfalls and get better and better at this. Developing habits for this is strategically critical. These transformations are gonna to continue to evolve. They're gonna continue coming, and the next years are going to see a lot of different things come from this. And we have to be very prepared to do this. The thing is that the tenets and the great tenets of communication are ultimately going to remain the same. The challenges are going to be different. The mediums are going to be different. But what we need to be able to do is actually good communication is still going to look like good communication. And that is to make it a habit, a habit like an athlete, muscle memory, so that you start to get to understand what your triggers are where your emotional sensitivity is, where your frustration or shortness of temper is or patience, and say, I'm not going to go there. There's something better for me to do here. There's something more generous, something more calculated, something more caring, something more specific for me to do here rather than to let this devolve into an issue that is unnecessary. Because we want something to get appropriated, this communication to get appropriated into the essence of what we do. And for these skills to be developed into habits, it means that people must accept that change is not only inevitable, but it is absolutely necessary for them to be participating in it. So as an instructor at CEU EMBA program, this is exactly the challenge I have in the approach that we take. I'd like you guys just to do this for a second. I'd like everybody to put their hand out in front of them, one hand, and just put your thumb up. And I want you to put your forefinger out in the other hand like that. And then I want you to switch them. And switch 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 and switch. And you just keep it straight, right? So technically we want we don't want to stray from this too much. It's really specific. It's that and that and that and that and that and that and that. And you're gonna be as accurate and as fast as you can. What's going on here, guys? Everybody's stopping. What's what's going on? I want to ask this question: how long did you have patience for this? Because I saw over here this gentleman we met earlier, he had about 13 seconds in him, it seemed. Yeah, some of you had a little less, some of you a little more, and some of you are up there still like, solve this. 
Right. What's going on in our minds when we see this? Well, my experience with this is, why can't I do this? It seems easy. First of all, it seems dumb. What for? Right? But then it seems like, okay, well, why can't I? And then when you start to realize, like, I can't do this yet, it gets frustrating. And then we do things like either give up, we do things like say, I'll just go to chaos, or we do things like, meh, and we start to think about different things to do instead of this. And we do that with communication as well. You probably realize this. You delay confrontation. You delay the difficult talk. You delay that feedback. And the thing is, is you have to understand that in order to be able to do this, you have to have a lot of time like me to be able to sit and learn this over and over again so that I can even maybe go to this level, right? <laughs> right? You have to really want it. But that's the thing is that that's what we're facing. We're facing our own frustration and our own temptation to give up. And that's what we do in class is we say, we're not doing that. We're identifying what the issues are. We're putting this into practical exercises. We're putting this into catered exercises that are specifically for what you're dealing with, the questions that you have. And then we put them into simulated systems. That could be dramatized circumstances. That could be online having you give presentations or giving impromptu speeches or giving impromptu uh, debates or giving whatever it might be, writing a commercial in 20 seconds in front of our eyes and telling us why. Whatever it is, we're putting that out to you in a very specific and practical way so that you have to exercise these things, so that you have to take these skills and start building upon them. So during these applications and simulations, the participants re receive immediate feedback. They receive immediate feedback from themselves, from me, from the others who are watching them do this. And they get the opportunity to immediately apply them, no matter how absurd the idea even seems. Try this, do that instead learning through trial and error, maybe taking an extreme approach to it, and then you find out, wow, a certain version of this actually moves me in the right direction. And that's what it's about. We're learning from each other's mistakes. We're learning from each other's successes. And you're actually doing it in a practically applicable environment. And so when we leave that space, we always say, what are some things you're going to take with you and potentially do differently or at least build upon going forward? And that, I believe, is the system that we can use to build habits. And then finally, you get to take it from that experimental laboratory, virtual reality space that we create, whether that be online or here in the classroom, and then you get to try it day to day in your work life and start to see how this thing builds up. So the funny thing is, is that we may think we might know or feel that we're above average in all these things we do in day-to-day -day life. And you guys may be above average drivers. You know, I actually pulled my foot off the clutch when it was in gear for some reason in front of the red light last time and I stalled the car as soon as I think, was thinking this, so I realized that I still have something to learn about cars as well. But we're certainly not always above average in communication. And we're certainly not always developed and prepared enough to handle the situations that are coming for us. But it is something that we can actually drastically improve over time. And we can take it step by step through practice and understanding and focus to get it to be a habit of ours that pushes us forward so that we can be that type of leader that we really like to be, that we actually need to be, and that organizations need to have going forward. Because we'd like for communication to be a deep-seated series of habits that don't define who you are, but they define exactly what you do. So this is the exact thing that at CEU's EMBA program uh, that I'm completely committed to bringing here year in and year out. And that is my story for you guys here today. So thank you very much. I'm very, very pleased and happy to field questions if that's good, or if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, I'd love to answer if I know the answer. If I don't, I will say pass. Anything at all? Thank you guys very much for joining today. Well, let's take a match. Oh, yeah, we're not taking a sure. Let me just share the screen and introduce Maciej to our attendees. Um, Professor Maciej Kiglowski is CEO Executive MBA's Faculty Director and Associate Professor of Law and Strategy. 
He's got a JSD degree from Yale, an MPA from Princeton, and an MBA from INSEAD. He publishes in basically three disciplines, management, law, political economy. He advises governments and international organizations, progressive political movements all around the world. And he's a frequent contributor in international media, including political project syndicates, foreign policy, Wall Street Journal. Maciej, please join the discussion. Thank you so much, Andy. This was so interesting and it's so, so much connects uh, with... Um, uh, thank you so much also, Thomas, for, for the amazing introduction, but you should stop <laughs> sharing this slide because I will blush. Uh, <laughs> you said too, good, too many good things about me. Um, so I, uh, I really love your presentation. As, as you know, what I do uh, professionally and my current research focus is how we uh, interact both, uh, both as business people, but also as political leaders with people with whom we completely disagree and not like just like disagree on you know what's our favorite food but yeah. like disagree on what constitutes a human right yes i mean that's the kind of world we live in in which we need to have some like if for example if you want to tackle cl climate change yes i mean we will need to work with pretty terrific governments, yes, in order to solve climate change. So how does it relate to your topic? Because like, I mean, all that you are talking about is to make connections between between people, yes? And you are very non-judgmental if uh, in uh, kind of uh, taking both sides of the conversation or the communication relationship as, you know, as given, as, as just like, you know, bona fide uh, uh, good faith actors. But we know that this is not entirely the world, yes? That's right. There are multiple studies that show the perception of things that are crucially connected with what you so amazingly teach at our leadership program. Things like charisma or, or even clarity, smartness. Mm. All those things are so much related with our ingrained biases. And of course, we you know, discuss as two men here, but fortunately in the program, we have a much more diverse, you know, both faculty you co-teach with, uh, uh, you know, award-winning uh, 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 female communication expert, Marta Holo, who is yeah. one of the leading Hungarian TV anchors, and she co-teaches with, with, with you this course. So, so for the participants who are uh, looking at this debate, don't think that it's always two, you know, men who are discussing diversity here. It's, but, but still, even in this group, yes, even in this setting that's, that, that happened on this particular evening, I think those issues need to be raised. And I, I wonder what's your opinion about how communication techniques and communication coaches like you should 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 address these issues that this is not yeah. a level playing field yeah this is a very it's first of all it's a fantastic question and it's a, it just gives us an opportunity to look at a, at a perspective on this that is that is actually one of the most daunting it's it's what oftentimes makes people the most scared to be a good communicator is exactly what you're talking about because what people often do in these cases that they build essentially a system of defenses around themselves here. And they assume that we're not going to come eye to eye. They assume that we're not going to come to some sort of common ground. They assume that some of our values and some of our wants and needs are not going to be met. And so we feel that this conflict is going to be a zero sum game on some level. And the thing is, is that this kind of communication specifically requires you to not assume that. Because if you assume that communication is going to be a zero sum game, then there's very little encouraging you to not be aggressive or passive or manipulative. Now, because you think that this is going to be that sort of equation. And as we know that in, if we look at conflict management or if we look at negotiation skills, which these two theories are very similar, then it goes to this question, I think, perfectly is that I need to come to this and say, I don't want to stand 
across from my rival. I don't want to stand in opposition to them. I know I don't agree. I know they don't agree with me. But I, fer I want to do all I can through communication to find out where we actually stand next to one another to where we can objectively identify this problem between us. And that's because without good communication, you can't do that. We, and you, we've experienced this. Take climate change. It's exactly this. Most people who don't believe climate change is imminent, dangerous, and frightening are not even in agreement with what the problem is for those who feel that there's something greatly to be feared. There's fundamental things to be changed, and we have to act now. So the thing is, we can't even agree on what the issue is yet. And that's a very early stage of, of solving this problem. And so I think the argument goes to this. These skills need to be so high so that we finally come and feel, and feel unthreatened by one another's communication so that we can agree that we disagree, <laughs> so that we can even just come to terms and say, look, we're not agreeing on something here, but we still have to take, and I think as Thomas mentioned here, we go to the facts. We go to the defining elements. We, don't, we go to specifics, and we find out where do we agree that we want things to change. And the thing is, is that this is only really facilitated by effective communication. Because if not, then we have to go and get a mediator, and we have to go immediately to compromise, and we go to the, all these other solutions that actually leave people very unhappy and potentially leave us in danger. So yes, I think these skills need to be very much coached. They need to become part of second nature, and that it, it, they actually have to supersede ego and frustrations. Mm -hmm. That makes okay, sense. That's a good answer for your question. Uh, this is fantastic. Let me uh, ask on, on a completely different uh, topic. I just want to cover kind of a few things uh, sure. before Thomas cuts us short because it's such a treat <laughs> to uh, it's such a treat to have you. Um, uh, so the online thing is yes, the big elephant yeah. in the room. What is your prediction from a kind of importance of communication? Do you think? about the post-COVID world? Do you think communication will drive organizations to go back to their physical offices? Or do you think, mm. do you believe in this kind of next normal narrative that, uh, that we will just communicate differently? Yeah, this is another really tricky question. Uh, the statistics on it, if you are in favor of the new normal, the statistics are, will make you happy. <laughs> it seems that 70 plus percent of people will be satisfied to stay in the two-dimensional world of communication currently. Uh, now, we don't know what all the factors. It could still be pandemic fear. It could still be issues with just being disoriented and distant enough from others for long enough now that they, they settle in with this. My fear is, is that businesses are going to be very pleased with the cost-cutting ability that they can make here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a little bit of, uh, of, a, of a misdirection. So I hope that that is not what drives the decision. However, I would, to be a little bit boring, I would have to say that I find the hybrid solution to make the most sense. And that is, I was very pleasantly surprised at the positive efficacy or the effectiveness of communication online. I was not convinced. I was in February and March, I was learning to, to instruct and run workshops and even run theater rehearsals and even run uh, screenwriting uh, uh, writers' uh, rooms online, and I was very surprised at how they worked. They actually worked pretty well, and some of the participants preferred them. I didn't prefer them, but I was surprised that they worked well. So what I'm hoping is that, as you mentioned, and I think, Macha, this is the most important thing, we actually need, humans need human connection. It's very, very validating. It's, it gives this deep purpose. And without human connection, it's very, very hard for us to get the right emotional content to signpost our, our needs, our deeper needs and our deeper wants. And this is a more complex psychological idea, but I actually believe that that's true. However, I am a little concerned that we will take the shortcut on this for a while. So I think the new normal, unfortunately, is going to take hold. I think we're going to see the numbers of reliance on that go up for a while. Then I think there will be a trend saying, get us back in the room with one another. And then I think over time, we are going to settle into a blend where we're going to say, we're going to need to spend time together. We're going to have to have certain groups that are physically in the same space together doing things. And we're going to have to 
make certain sacrifices or make certain decisions where the two-dimensional world is enough. Um, and that I, you know, I'm sorry to give you kind of a middle of the road answer, but I genuinely <laughs> think that that's, that's what's going to happen. Yes, the, I mean, facts are the most important, yes? Uh, Thomas told yes. us that in his presentation. <laughs> and he said, yeah. 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 Even, yeah. If, even if they don't fit any kind of, you know, exotic narrative. But Yeah, uh, I wish I had like a sexy answer for you, but I really think that that's it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. This was perfect, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Let's talk about facts. Let's talk about the questions that you have, that you have shoot in the chat box during our open mm -hmm. day. Um, I've collected them and I would like to ask much a couple of those questions. Um, the first questions with which uh, a couple of people have asked online is the elephant in the room, Marche, is what about COVID measures on uh, campus and are we moving online or not? Thank you so much. Uh, so I think COVID generally um, shows how we approach our job, our relations with our executive fellows. I, 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 of course, because of my job, I am pretty in tune with the industry. And I know that a vast majority of other players simply moved classes online. And that was it. We, uh, by contrast, uh, out of the four modules that we had this academic year since September, had three modules, three out of four in, the, in this crazy pandemic year uh, that uh, allowed some form of on-site on participation. Of course, a lot of people couldn't travel or were not comfortable traveling. We can't do anything with that. Well, we can by uh, creating a very good and improving online option, the hybrid model that Andy was talking about in general. But I think that shows you uh, kind of the commitment we have to go out of our way to make this experience as rich, as meaningful. Like we are not an MBA factory. We have just one cohort a year. We are a small university. Well, I, I mean, we are of course very fortunate with resources, but we are very small. Mm, and uh, uh, in, in terms of just like student faculty ratio, we, we have one of the best in Europe and uh, one of the lowest in Europe. And, and you know, when, when, when it, we had a module in Octo late October in Vienna, just before the pandemic really shoot out, we were the one of the first uh, universities in Vienna that uh, deployed the antigen rapid testing. I mean, now it's everywhere, but like in October, it was actually an experimental technology. Uh, you know, in the in the summer, we split the class, as Thomas mentioned, it's about 65 people. So we split it into two sections so that we can maintain distancing so you would literally be in an auditorium of 140 people and there would be just like 25 of you um, <laughs> to create safe environment so we, we, we are of course as as everybody uh, subject to regulations and laws which we follow uh, to the letter um, in that we are an American university um, that we take those things seriously However, we, we do everything in our power to give you as many of our participants as good opportunity to participate on site. Uh, I will give you another example. In the spring module, we had just three people who managed to get into Vienna and from those who are from Austria who were comfortable and had had, you know, were already vaccinated, so they wanted to come on campus. We still opened that campus for those three people. Uh, so we, we still we still provided you know the entire infrastructure, IT services for just three people who were who were able to do it. Yes, that's that's kind of our approach. You are not a number. You are not a registration number. You are our colleague with whom we try to co-create this experience in a spirit of partnership. We don't, uh, we, we, we are honest. We, we say what we can do 
because of the legal restrictions and what we can do, and we try to find currently solutions. So that's our approach to COVID. Uh, we think there is an opportunity out of this crisis, which is that in a modular program like this, there may be other reasons but COVID, when, especially if you are more kind of far away from Vienna or Budapest, where you may want to participate in one of the modules, especially those uh, shorter ones, the three-day ones, uh, online. And that's why we are offering, we are learning like everybody. And now we are saying, let's offer everybody a choice to join online. If you want to join online because of COVID, or if you don't want to join online because you have, an, we have participants coming as far as the West Coast of North America, maybe some of them will come just once or twice a year, but not to every module, that's fine. <clears throat> We are opening this option. We have now upgraded substantially our already excellent infrastructure. In Vienna, we have four auditoriums now fully equipped at the studio grade, at the studio level. And, uh, and so you can be sure that whatever your situation is in August, in October, in uh, February next year, you will be able to get the quality uh, education, but also this, this kind of experience, this community experience um, that, that you were talking about. I thank you very much for the, um, for the answer. The next question deals with the importance of leadership. What is the importance of leadership in our program? Well, you saw what Andy was, one of our leaders of our CEO leadership program, our proprietary leadership development program, which we include as part of your degree. It's very unusual for an MBA to have a fully fledged leadership development program. By that we mean um, not only classes, but coaching, individual and group coaching. Uh, Andy will very soon have the second round of coaching this year with, with, with our MBA students, including Natalia. Uh, so all of these why are we doing it? Because we believe leadership is important. It's, it's, uh, and, and leadership is not, a, it's not a magic. It's not a mystique. Uh, there is now decades of research that Andy was also uh, re uh, re uh, uh, referring to, which shows you which approaches work, which approaches don't work. And you can learn and develop those skills as part of your uh, EMBA program. So yes, it's, it's very important and it's also smartly uh, scheduled. We schedule the leadership program in the summer when you generally have your mind a little, you know, clearer of uh, your work and all the piling up things. You know, it's a, the module is in Budapest, our beautiful campus where, where you are now, Thomas, uh, um, the, the weather is ama amazing. And it's just like a great environment to think about your leadership development. Uh, it's very intensive. There's not going to be, you know, easy, but, it's, but, I, but I think it's, 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 it's something quite unique. Hmm. Yeah, just to, if I can add to that sure. a bit, uh, what Max is talking about is, is basically to be able to physically come together in the same space, or at least many of us focusing on that, and having that time to be together, see each other, uh, even perform, do presentations, do these sorts of things, and then carry that out through the team activities online through the year, and then with Max and myself having online coaching sessions, what we try to do is we try to build up a few wants and needs types of things per student, so that we're actually able to tailor make the work towards what the student would like to do, what they would like to get better at. And that we can help them decide what that is. And some of them come very candidly and say, this is what I want to be better at. And so being able just to tailor make that uh, for people is just a great luxury for us as instructors as well. Mm -hmm. I will focus on the online questions because the attendees here have the opportunity to, to talk to me after the event. Um, and join drinks and snacks after the event. So we'll focus on the online questions. Of course, if there's any urgent questions, feel free to just raise your hand and ask. Um, Marcia, the next question is about exams and if there is a thesis. Yes, uh, so there are, 
I mean, that's part of this modular format uh, that, that we are really proud of. It's quite unique again in the industry. Mm, we don't do anything but like actual learning during the modules. So we don't waste your time. When you come for the module, we don't waste your time to sit on an exam or, you know, or do readings. Everything that is outside of actual, you know, interaction, in-class interaction is moved away from the module, even either before for the so-called preparation weeks, which we have before the module, which are kind of structured ways of you preparing for the module or after the week, uh, the module, and that includes exams. So the way if the, our exams work is you have 10 days um, during which you can, uh, you should reserve for yourself two, three hours of your time to sit uh, at an exam at your own preferred moment of time. Uh, you do it through our course management system online. And, and that's, and that's how, how our exams work. Exams generally happen early in the program with our quantitative courses. Uh, as you move forward, the work is much more project-based. Mm, you do it in support teams, which were already mentioned. Uh, they are teams of five or four participants. No one, not, not, no two people with the same industry, no two people with the same background, uh, mm, kind of intentionally taking you out of your comfort zone. Uh, so you do quite a bit of work in those teams. And then uh, the, 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 the final experience is that it's not the thesis. We don't have a thesis. We have, a, we have what's called the capstone project. And the capstone project run by um, already mentioned colleague, Mike Labelle, who is kind of great connecting theory and practice, uh, is, 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 is a portfolio of applications so basically, it's not a 50-page book that you write. It's a set of applications based on specific standards that you do during the second year of your program. So after the second uh, summer module. And you kind of in a guided way, you apply what you've learned. You show that you are able to apply what you've learned, that you actually make an impact in your organization, in your professional life, in your career management, in your, uh, you know, social uh, uh, change initiatives that you may have in your community. This is our approach to thesis. That's how you become, you know, that's how you earn this American and Austrian degree, uh, the CEO, formally master of business administration in global executive management yes that's this is our approach this is our approach to what makes your study complete it's not the writing a book or a small brochure it's making change using the knowledge that we give you to make change on the ground because our approach is we, we don't tell you just war stories. I mean, you saw it in Andy's presentation. We base our lessons and our teaching on data, on research, because our view is that theory is the opposite of practice only if it's a bad theory. A good theory <laughs> you measure by how informative is of your everyday practice, how, how much predictive power it gives you every single day in your work. Uh, so that's that's the approach and and the capstone project is just the proof that we kind of walk the talk you already mentioned the double degree what's the advantage of such a double degree so i mean it's pretty cool uh i, would <laughs> guess. Uh, I mean you know having an american degree without all these costs and you know, life complications of going to America. Most, as, as many of you know, most of um, uh, our competitors try to do it by kind of 
getting some partnership with some university in America to kind of give it American spirit. We are just at New York State University. We don't need anybody who to give us an American spirit. Yes, we, we, we are a New York State University that is, that is uh, undergoing American accreditations and quality reviews every, uh, 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 you know, every few years, just like any other American university, both in the, within the United States or abroad. We are also very, very pleased that we are an Austrian university and Austria has truly welcomed us with open arms. You've probably heard that um, the state of Vienna, uh, city state of Vienna gave CU this amazing property, uh, the Steinhof Hospital which we are developing for quarter of a billion with a B uh, dollars into a truly incredible American style campus. It, it is a kind of that style in a big park. Um, and I mean, it's going to be important for you because as Thomas mentioned, your story doesn't end you know, when you graduate. Every year we invite um, our alumni to join courses alongside the current students so that you can truly, you know, it's, it's kind of a never ending community because you, you come back to campus every summer and you, and you join current MBAs uh, uh, sitting in their electives. You actually um, get a fake grade as an alumnus or alumna and if you get B plus or more, you get a discount on your course. Uh, <laughs> so it's better, yes. Um, so, um, so, so the fact that CU, so I think why I'm talking about this, because I think it's not really a degree. Very few people who are our students like need a piece of paper. It's more like what it represents about the university. The CU is one of the most fast rising, ascendant, uh, exciting uh, universities in the world currently. I mean, this is, a, this is a hot place, which is every single year is getting better and better, more recognized. Uh, you know, when we got into a little bit of trouble with the Hungarian government, we have like, you know, tens of Nobel Prize winners writing on our behalf. Uh, you know, we had debates in the European Parliament, like how many universities have this? Yes, this, is, this is pretty incredible. And that shows you that we have built something that is not generic. It's not just like another private institution. It's, it's a university with a mission. And I think it's an attractive mission. And it's not a political mission. It's a mission that is focused on being intellectually honest and intellectually independent. And I, and I actually think that in the business world, this is a very important approach. We always say we are in the knowledge economy. So we're better to get a sense of the knowledge economy, innovative economy, than at an open society university, open world MPA program. Thank you very much for these powerful words. I would like, uh, taking into consideration the, the time, I would like to conclude with two questions. Um, what about the application procedure? What does it look like? How does it look like, Maciej? I think this is a question to you. I, I never, I never <laughs> understand all those details. <laughs> <laughs> so the application procedure is pretty straightforward and easy. You start your, your application online via our website. And uh, once you submitted your application, completed your application, we will revise it check, it, check it for completeness. And we will invite you for an interview with one of our faculty members. In the interview, your motivation will be assessed. We're not playing any mind games in the, in the interview. It's just the, the only opportunity to get to know you in this uh, short period of time. And you will be assessed. You will reach uh, a certain score. And uh, based on that score, you will, be, uh, you will receive an admission decision. It's pretty straightforward. And um, much if you would like to point out the only uh, cherry on top in that process, including involving our rector in, 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 the, in this process. Yeah, I mean, another like kind of like the, 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 the personal approach to COVID or like opening campus for free students from the same category of like, we treat you incredibly individually and personally. 
Uh, every single candidate goes to the CEU's president and rector, Michael Ignatiev, for the final approval. So everybody is kind of handpicked by, uh, by our top uh, academic leadership. And the reason why is this is a flagship program of CEU. This is the program for the most senior, the leaders of today and the leaders of tomorrow, most importantly. And we want to have this perfect class we want to have this balance of views that uh, Thomas was talking about. This is not a marketing pitch. This is a reality why we are doing it. After all, you already saw we were very honest. We are not doing this thing for money. CUC is a very wealthy institution, yes? We are doing it to really create something for the community of our executive fellows and for the world that is going to be kind of the consumer of your work as a leader in the years to come. And that's how we approach it. We, 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 are, we are really here to focus on quality, focus on making, focus on you feeling that you made a, a, a tremendous transformational progress during those two years. If that doesn't happen, we are unhappy. Yes, we, 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 this, is, this is why we are doing it. This is why everybody in this team, everybody on faculty, People, amazing people like Andy, you know, do what they do every day, uh, and 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 that's I think it's quite unique in our you know increasingly bureaucratic and boring world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last question, dealing uh, uh, speaking of, we're not doing it for money, deals with scholarship opportunities. Of course, the elephant in the room when it comes to finances. Um, if you allow, Marci, I will take uh, that question too to conclude this uh, event. We offer a variety of financial support. We offer the Open World Scholarship. We offer need-based scholarships, which take into consideration your income and the country of your residence. And we offer country-specific merit-based uh, fellowships. For example, a fellowship for Romani managers in Central Europe, a fellowship for uh, business women in Central Asia, Turkey, and Russia, a fellowship for LGBTIQ uh, professionals in internationally, um, et cetera, et cetera. We have a variety of those fellowships. So whatever your uh, scholarship approach is, we offer a variety of them. And I would like to uh, invite you to book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me via our website. Um, if you are interested in these scholarships and would like to receive personal advice, which scholarship might be the best or has the highest chances to, uh, for you to, to get, um, I would be happy to advise you in, in such a consultation. I think this is not the format to uh, individually advise you on uh, uh, scholarships. But just to conclude, there is a huge variety of scholarship and we're proud and happy to pass them to our participants. If you would like to add something to it, Maciej, feel free. Otherwise, I would like to thank everybody on site and online. Um, we're not used to do it on site. It's, <laughs> we have to get used to, to, to do that again. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks everybody for joining us online, wherever you are in the world and for the attendees here on campus. Thank you, Maciej, thank you, Andy. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thanks, everyone.